Where does the energy for chemical reactions come from? Many chemical reactions, even exergonic reactions, require an input of energy to get started. On ancient Earth, before the formation of macromolecules, chemical reactions were powered by lightning, sunlight, and heat from molten rock. On the modern Earth, living organisms, including humans, most often obtain the energy they need from other molecules. Cells use the energy in these food molecules to power chemical reactions. However, the energy cannot be used directly. It must be transferred first to an energy-carrying intermediary, such as the compound adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. When chemical bonds in ATP are broken, energy is released. This process provides the energy needed for chemical reactions which power life. This graph shows a hypothetical reaction between atom A and a molecule containing atoms B and C. The activation energy, Ea, is the amount of energy needed to get the reactants to the transition state in which bonds are broken and new bonds are formed. This transition state usually lasts for a fraction of a second. In this example, the products of the reaction are the molecule AB and the atom C. Because this is an exergonic reaction, some of the energy stored in the reacting molecules is released. Often, activation energy can be a barrier that prevents a chemical reaction from occurring, except very slowly. The activation energy for many chemical reactions can be reduced with catalysts. Without catalysts, many of the chemical reactions of metabolism would occur too slowly to support life. Catalysts stabilize the reactants in the transition state, allowing old bonds to break and new bonds to form. Even though the activation energy is lowered by a catalyst, the amount of energy released by the reaction is unchanged. In living organisms, most chemical reactions are catalyzed by proteins called enzymes. The three-dimensional structure of an enzyme is crucial to its function. If this structure is disrupted by exposure to high temperatures, for example, the enzyme stops working. The enzyme binds reactants in its active site, which is specially shaped to fit the reactants. The reactants on which enzymes act are called substrates. In this example, glucose is the substrate of the enzyme hexokinase. The enzyme and substrates are represented here in an artist's drawing. The substrates include the atom A and the molecule BC. The substrates enter the active site of the enzyme. By holding these atoms close together, the enzyme reduces the amount of energy the atoms need to enter the transition state. In the transition state, the bond between atoms B and C is broken, and a new bond between A and B is created. When the new bonds form, the products are released, and the enzyme molecule is ready to catalyze another reaction. Each enzyme is specific for only one reaction. For example, this enzyme could not catalyze a reaction between atom A and molecule BD. The fit between an enzyme and its substrate is described by the lock and key model. The enzyme is the lock and the substrate is the key. Only a specific substrate will fit the enzyme's active site. Another model of enzyme-substrate interaction is called the induced fit model. It proposes that once the enzyme binds the substrate to the active site, the enzyme changes shape slightly to bind the substrate even more firmly. This places a strain on the existing bonds in the substrate, thereby lowering the activation energy needed to break the old bonds and generate new ones.